Listen, this life on this, this side is, it's this. It's gone. This is not the goal. This is only training ground for eternity in heaven. This, this day, there are no Monday mornings in heaven, amen? But Monday mornings on this side are preparing us for eternity with God. And wh- how you live your life and what you, what you choose to do on the Monday mornings and the Monday, listen, we can't avoid the brokenness of this world, but what we can do is prepare ourselves for an eternity in heaven. And that's what we're doing. In this very, very short, limited time, we're preparing ourselves. We're learning some things about God. One day, everything's going to be made clear. Thank you, Dave. Felt like I was back in science class a little bit there. That was, that was helpful. We're beginning a new series today on the book of Ecclesiastes. And my wife and I were talking not too long ago few weeks ago thinking about how many sermon series have we heard on the book of Ecclesiastes. And so we took the number of times she's heard a sermon series and mine, and we added it together and we got zero. So the book of Ecclesiastes, I don't know how many times, we might, we've heard a message here and there, but to hear a, a whole sermon series, and it's, it's a book that's often ignored. It's easy to overlook because it's very confusing. It's a difficult book to understand, and uh, so I'm asking for some grace for the next few weeks. And can I get any grace out there on this book? Okay. Whew. Wow, tough crowd, tough crowd. Uh, the, the series is called The Search, the book of Ecclesiastes. None of, none of the reformers wrote commentaries on Ecclesiastes because nobody really knew the meaning of it. Martin Luther wrote one commentary on it, and then a few years later said, uh, I think I was wrong on that. So he wrote another commentary on it. It's like, I think this is what it means. And then after that said, I actually have no idea what the book means. So the, the, the reformers didn't write about it. It's, it's a difficult book to understand, but we're going to do our best because here's what I know to be true. If it's part of God's word, then it is relevant for all of us here today. I don't need to make it relevant. It is already relevant. Now I can make it irrelevant, but it is relevant for our lives today. The book of Ecclesiastes, we don't really know for certain who the author is. There's some belief that, uh, I think the common thought is Solomon wrote it. That's the most popular belief. Solomon wrote the book, but the the language and genre of literature tends to be closer to the 400 years of silence leading up to the New Testament. So chronologically, many believe that it was actually the last book of the Bible written chronologically in the Old Testament. Uh, The reason for that is you've you've got the Jewish nation is scattered uh, at this point. You also have uh, what was common in Hebrew literature at this time was someone writing in through the eyes of a different persona. So someone writing to evaluate current culture through the persona of someone else. In this case, it would have been Solomon. And so it'd be like Abraham, writing through the eyes of Abraham Lincoln in today's culture, 2024. That was common in Hebrew culture at this time. Regardless, it's written through the perspective of Solomon, who is the wisest person to have ever lived. He asked for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. And so, a very wise man. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The, the theme of the book, the overall theme, it begins with the, the preacher, but it's, it's told through a teacher's eyes. So, chapter 1 and chapter 12 kind of bookends the whole book by saying, there's an assembly of people gathered together, and someone's going to try to teach this group of people. So, that is... That's what's happening in, in the book. The 12 chapters of, of Ecclesiastes. We'll spend a few weeks going through this book. Some of the themes of the book, uh, which we'll see right out of the gate, is this word vanity. Vanity of vanities. All of life is vanity. The best translation for that really isn't vanity. It's more vapor or mist. 
vapor or mist? Have you ever pursued something that you just were never able to really grasp? In this world, we have often, if we share stories with each other, we've chased things. We've chased jobs. We've chased careers. We've chased people. We've chased different things. And you never grab hold of it. You feel like you almost got it. You almost got that dream job. You get the dream job, and guess what? You still have a boss at your dream job, and there's still conflict there. And the best way to describe it is like a mist or a vapor. Later on in the New Testament, James talks about life being like a mist. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And the older I get, the realize, I realize more and more how fast life goes, right? And so the mist... You see it for a second, I go to grab it, it's gone. I can't even feel it. So what the author of Ecclesiastes, the theme of the whole book is that life is like a mist. We pursue things, we chase after things. Another theme, the book, you'll see it often is chasing the wind. The wind's going to pick up a little bit later today. I encourage you to go out in your driveway on the street or your backyard and chase it. Let me know how that goes. Chasing after the wind is what the author says thousands of years ago. It's what it felt like they did then, and it's no different today, right? This was written a long time ago. This wasn't written yesterday in our culture. This was written thousands of years ago. Life is like a vapor, right? You see it, and, it's, and then it's gone. A difficult book to interpret. Some of us, some of the famous passages of the book, later on in the book, um, it talks about, the author talks about, there's a season and a time for everything. Maybe you've heard that. Uh, those who have no religious background have probably heard that either at a funeral at one point. Hey, there's a season, there's a time. Turn, turn, turn. You're thinking of the birds, the song, turn for every season. Okay, a couple of you are tracking with me on that. A time to born, time to die, a time for war, a time for peace, a time for joy, a time for grief, right? The author sums up basically all of life in that. But it's a difficult book to understand. And so we thought we were having trouble with our parking lot and crowds, so we're going to dive into this series, a very depressing, negative, pessimistic sermon series. How excited are you? But we believe every word of the Bible is relevant and speaks truth to us today. And some are more difficult than others. Some passages are more challenging than others. But we're going to do our best as we go through this passage. Chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Right out of the gate, here's the theme. You're going to see that over and over. In Hebrew culture, you repeat something that's pretty important. Think with me. The book, another book that Solomon wrote, we may never preach on that one. I may get fired on that one. Song of Songs, right? Just kidding. Song of Solomon, right? When it's important, you repeat it. Song of Songs. It's not just a song. It is the Song of Songs, Right? It's not just a holy place, it is what? The holy of holies. And the author is saying here, it's not just, life is not just vanity. It is vanity of all vanities. It is the meaningless of all meaninglessness. What, is, what does man gain by the toil at which he toils? And now here's another common phrase, three words. Say it with me. We learned a little bit about the sun from Dave. Say it with me. Under the sun. Say it with me again. Under the sun. What is the author saying? Everything we see, everything that we experience on planet Earth is what the author is saying is under the sun. It's what, it's what we relate to. It's our jobs. It's our careers. It's our family. It's, it's everything. It's our work. It's, it's our experience with creation. Everything under the sun, what does man gain? And the author is going to answer that by saying nothing. Like, Whoa. You're taking notes. Like You don't gain anything in all your labor, in all your, your work, in all your career efforts. You don't, you don't gain anything under the sun. A generation goes, verse 4, 
and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. It's no surprise. I don't think this is anything new for you being here today, but let me just say it. You will die. There's a day coming. You'll die. You won't be here any longer, and you're your next generation that you're part of will be wiped off and, and the next generation will be gone. Generations come and, and go. But creation stands, right? The mountains will still be here. Sometimes I, I'm pretty excited to get to the peak of a mountain. Like, ooh, I made it. Like, take that mountain. And the mountain's like, yeah, I'll, when you're gone, I'll still be here. I've been here. I've seen a lot of people come and go on top of my peaks. They're all gone. And there's a day coming, you're going to be gone, but the mountain will stand forever. The mountain has seen a lot of things. The mountains that we climb and we think we conquer, and the mountain doesn't care at all about who's climbing it. That's what the author's saying here. Generations have come and gone, and not only will we be gone, nobody will remember us. Real exciting message today, right? We're going to come, we're going we're gonna to die but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. He's talking about creation. There's a rhythm of creation every day. You and I don't have to guess what the sun's going to do tomorrow. It's, it's going to rise. And the next day after that, it's been rising for thousands of years. And after we're gone, it's going to continue to rise and set. East and west. Love seeing a beautiful sunset, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing to enjoy or a beautiful sunrise. Some of, some of you are sunset people. Some of you are sunrise people. But it's been rising for thousands of years. And it will continue to rise and set long after we're gone. Let's do what the author's saying. The word hasten here is actually, in, in Hebrew, actually translated better pants. It's like a dog panting after it's been running for a long time. The author's saying, even creation, is. there's a labor and a toil in creation. That the sun is it's panting up and down and up and down, right? Over and over and over again. And the next verse, 6. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. The author's making sure we've got east covered, we've got west covered, we've got north covered, we've got south covered. There is nowhere you can go in this world under the sun where you will find meaning and purpose in this world under the sun. All of creation, there is an exhaustion within creation. It's verse 4. Four through seven. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. At this time, they didn't have clear access to the Mediterranean, so the closest body of water was the Dead Sea. All the water runs into the Dead Sea. It doesn't fill up. It evaporates. The Dead Sea, it's where things go to die. All the waters are flowing to this place. What's the author saying? There are waves crashing on the, the shores. Every, every few seconds, the waves are crashing. They've been crashing on the beach long before we came, and they'll continue to crash long after we're gone. And it's, it's something we are able to enjoy, but the author's saying, hey, the same thing happens over and over and over again. Nothing new under the sun. Some of us can relate to that. We may have changed jobs, but we still have the same conflict. We may have changed different things in our life. We, we've chased after different things. We thought the grass was greener over here, but we wake up one day and we're like, oh, I, think I, I think I've got the same problems I had before. Nothing new under the sun. So that's creation. He's describing the toil and the exhaustion and the labor of creation. Now, you and I, we have a choice when we interact with creation. We, we have the opportunity to enjoy it. I think every, every person can enjoy it. There's a long list of boats heading down Ellsworth, right past us, right? Going to play on the lake and enjoy the, the beauty of creation. You, you can use it just for your enjoyment, or you can also use it to ascribe God the glory, recognizing that he ultimately is the creator. 
All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. Have you ever felt that way? Labor in vain. Oh, every Monday morning is coming. The nine to five, the Monday through Friday, the night shift, whatever your rhythm is, it's like, man, I remember I stepped in my, off, my wife's office this week. She works from home. And she's got this little flip calendar with the date on it. And I feel like I just flipped it. And I went in there yesterday. It was like three weeks ago. I, I, I thought I just changed the day. Time moves so fast. Days moving so fast. Days turn to week, turn to months, turn to, turn to years, right? The weariness of our Monday through Friday, nine to five. Sometimes we're so exhausted we can't utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Now just a little note on this. One of the things Jesus says in all four of the Gospels is those who have ears, let them hear. Those who have eyes, let them see. Jesus, we're going to see later in this passage, Jesus is really the only one who's going to have a chance at giving us purpose and meaning in life if you so receive it. This author says, no eye is satisfied, no ear is filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new, say it with me, there is nothing new under the sun. Under the sun, that's where we're living right now. You and I live for this season of our existence under the sun. And sometimes we feel like, if you feel like, I feel like sometimes, I feel like I'm under a curse. You ever relate? Man, everything I do, it feels like, man, I can't catch a break. I, I'm working harder, and I'm not getting noticed. I'm, I, I'm chasing after this, and I'm never able to really get there. The author can relate to what you and I relate to. This wasn't written yesterday. This was written thousands of years before, and not much has changed. The exhaustion of, of mankind is it's futile. All things are weary. What has been is what will be. What has been done, there's nothing new under the sun. You're like, well, there's a lot of new technology. There's a lot of new things. The author's saying, no, but those things all break, right? With new technology comes a lot more frustration many times. And we all can relate to that. Frustration is not new. Brokenness is not new. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things things yet to be among those who come after. This is a, this is a difficult text. I mean, this is the word of God and author Solomon, either him directly or writing in his persona saying, Hey, all of life is meaningless. Good luck tomorrow as you go to work. There's no purpose to your labor under the sun. I mean, it's the same old, same old. You're like, man, I'm glad I came to church today. This verse is really, really encouraging. If you've ever felt like you're under a curse, let me me share with you, this series also could have been called East of Eden. The only time in the Bible, there's two chapters in Genesis and two chapters in Revelation where no sin exists. Then there's 1,189 chapters of sin. But the first two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, is pre-sin. After sin enters the world, God comes to Adam and Eve, and what does he do? He kicks them out of the garden. And which direction does he send them? He sends them east. And from that point on, every person who's ever lived under the sun has lived east of Eden. Meaning we've all lived under the curse of sin. Every person, Every person in this room lives under the curse of sin. Every person that you have ever met, your neighbor, your coworker, they live under this curse of sin. We live east of Eden. 
No one can escape living east of Eden. God kicks them out. He sends them east of the garden. And from that point on, we live under the curse of sin. So if you ever, ever felt like, man, what I'm chasing, I can't ever get. If you ever, ever felt like your work is in vain. If you ever felt broken, like your company's broken, your neighborhood is broken, your school is broken. That is why. Because we live east of Eden. And so what do we, what do, we do about that? Where's the, where's the hope? This message is really encouraging for all of us. Hang in there. We're going to get there. But even more than that, I want you to know that the people that you interact with, the people you, you see face to face, they feel like there is no meaning and there is no purpose in their life. Every 11 minutes in our country, someone takes their life because they feel like life is meaningless and I have no purpose in this, in this world. 28 million people in the United States have thought about taking their life this past year. Every 11, maybe that's part of your story. Maybe that's an experience that you've, maybe you personally or somebody in your family, you've had friends. This is, I'm telling you, this passage, this book of Ecclesiastes is relevant for today. Because I was at the dog park this week. Everything comes back to the dog park. I got 10 people standing around, our dogs are off playing. It's like, oh, do you believe in God? I'm like, well, that's a really good question. I'd like to have that conversation with you. The author never uses the word Lord. He, he talks about God. But there are people in our lives, in our communities, who they may believe in a, in a God, but they do not believe that God, God is going to make a personal impact in my life. That's what the author is saying. Hey, there's a creator God, but it doesn't matter what you do, where you go, it's meaningless under the sun. One of the greatest pessimists of our generation, Ernest Hemingway, he, he believed ultimately death wins. The only way we can have any kind of victory is for us to decide the time and place and means of our own death. The ultimate circle. And that's ultimately what he chose to do. The playwright Tennessee Williams says, we all live in a house on fire. There's no fire department to call. There's no way out. Just the upstairs window to look out while the fire burns the house down with us trapped all inside. You're like, well, that's, that's really depressing. Listen, you sit down, you have coffee with your friends who do not believe in, a, in Jesus. This is what they will say. I just, I don't have any purpose. I don't think there's any meaning. I don't, if there is a God, like, where is he? Most people get a fair amount of fun out of their lives, but on the balance, they're suffering, and the only very young or the very foolish imagine otherwise, author George Orwell. So in, here in chapter 1, you just see the cycle. You see the, the futility of man's labor. You see the futility of creation. And you're going to see the futility of wisdom here. I, the preacher, have been keen over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Now in verse 13, we're going to look at this, this passage. This is an important passage, verse Sorry, 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Right? Everything in our life under the sun is crooked. I'm crooked. You're crooked. Our church is crooked. Our work is crooked. Our community is crooked. Our state is crooked. Our nation is crooked. The world is crooked. And the author's saying, what is crooked can't be made straight. Now listen to what, Jesus, what is said about Jesus in Luke chapter 3. Listen, the Bible is a powerful book. It is alive. This is what John says. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain hill be made low. The crooked paths shall be made what? Straight. 
There is only one person that can make what has been crooked and make what is vanity and make what is meaningless straight. In humanity, nothing that is crooked can ever be made straight. You would need a God to do that. Meaning is the cure. And I would add to that, hope is the cure. And we find hope and we find meaning only in the person of Jesus. My hope, as the old hymn goes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. In this world, under the sun, the only thing, the only thing that can give us meaning and purpose is a personal relationship with Jesus who can make what is broken and crooked and can make it, make it straight. Jesus gives us meaning. In Romans chapter 3, Paul writes, There is none righteous. No, not one. None is righteous. East of Eden, no one is righteous. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. This is, this is Paul in Romans saying similar things to what the preacher says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. But there's hope. But there's hope. For all have sinned, later on in Romans 3, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. It is only through a personal relationship with Jesus that you and I can experience anything new. Listen, we're not immune to the brokenness of the world. We're not immune to Monday mornings and nine to fives and heartache and brokenness and grief. We're not immune to that. But we wake up on Monday morning with the hope that one day there will, everything will be made new. That one day there will be no sin. Revelation 21 says, when it is all over and the devil's been thrown into hell, Satan is defeated, Jesus is on the throne. Behold, now the home of God is with men. They will be their God and they will be his people. Listen, the former things are passed away and everything is made new. Compare that to what we just read in Ecclesiastes chapter one. But there is nothing new. In Jesus, my friend, if you've not given your life to Jesus, you are, you're living and chasing after everything under the sun. In Jesus, in Isaiah 62, you are given a new name. In Matthew 26, you're given a new covenant. You're given a new community in Ezekiel. You're given a new commandment, Jesus says. I give you a new, what? Commandment that you love one another. You're given a new way to heaven. You're given a new nature. You're given a new creation. And ultimately, all things will be made new. Listen, this life on this, this side, is, it's this. It's gone. This is not the goal. This is only training ground for eternity in heaven. This, this day, there are no Monday mornings in heaven, amen? But Monday mornings on this side are preparing us for eternity with God. And wh- how you live your life and what you, what you choose to do on the Monday mornings and the Monday, listen, we can't avoid the brokenness of this world, but what we can do is prepare ourselves for an eternity in heaven. And that's what we're doing. In this very, very short, limited time, we're preparing ourselves. We're learning some things about God. One day, everything's going to be made clear. Paul talks about on this side, in this brokenness, east of Eden, we're looking at the world like it's a foggy mirror. When you get out of the shower, the mirror's all foggy. It's, it's, you can't, you, you can tell there's something there, but it's not very clear. Paul says one day everything's going to be made clear. We stand before Jesus. There's, everything's going to have meaning. Everything's going to have purpose. But on this side, I don't know what that meaning is. Most of the things that happened in my life, number one, completely out of my control. Number two, I have no idea why it happened. Because I'm looking through a mirror. It's all foggy. 
It's, it's broken glass. I don't understand it. But one day, everything's going to make sense. And I believe it's going to be instant. I, I'm, God's not going to have me a- ask all these questions. I think instantly before Jesus, everything becomes crystal clear. And I can't wait for that day. And on that day, right, the song, the lyrics we sang this morning, on that day, there's that day coming when everything in me fails. I'm about to come up face to face with Jesus. But on this side, throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, there are some moments that we can enjoy east of Eden. What are those moments? The author throughout the book is going to give us some moments. One of the moments is enjoying the gift of God. And if you and I were to talk, we could probably share some some experiences where I was sitting in his presence and I was experiencing God himself. It's not most days, it's not 24-7. But there are a few moments where you just, you're basking in the goodness of God and what he's given to us and what he's done for us. And we see it, it's just a little window. Oh, I saw it. Have you ever experienced that? You just, you're overwhelmed by God's grace and goodness. And maybe it's, maybe it's a really nice meal with your family or it's, you, you are enjoying the sunset or the sunrise. You're just overwhelmed with the goodness of God. There's these moments. It's not most of life, but there's these moments where God lets us see things clearly. And one day, what we have lived in a fog and in a mist on this side, one day, will be made all, will be made clear. The purpose of creation is to put the glory of God on display, his justice and his goodness. And the best part of heaven is that it's not here. Everything that is perfect in heaven will come with the memory of what we have here. Everything will feel like a complete miracle. Here we're bound to frustration and futility and exhaustion and brokenness. There will be, there we will be bound to joy and perfection and meaning. As so we have the mind of Christ. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope, not just for today, but hope for our future. You and I are designed and built to live forever. We were created to live forever. And only a very, 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 you know that percentage that Dave shared with us? Imagine that same percentage is the percentage that we're living here on earth. It's a very small percentage. But this is training ground for our eternity in the presence of God. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this passage that is so relevant today. Whether people are searching for meaning and purpose everywhere they look. And the reality is they'll never find it apart from you. I pray that that would be a reminder for us here in the room today that apart from Jesus, my life has no meaning and no purpose. And anyone who walked into the room without a relationship with Jesus that they would recognize that he can make their path straight, that he can take what is crooked in their life and make it, make it good. He can, only Jesus can give us meaning and purpose. And God, as we read this text, as we can't help but think, boy, this is pretty depressing. But as we turn our focus towards you, we long for the day where we are in your presence. We long for that day when we stand face to face and everything be made clear and good and right. And God, forgive us when we have tried to find salvation in things under this sun, when really only salvation can be found under the sun, the sun, Jesus. I pray you would move. Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts this morning. If there are things we need to confess to you, you would make that clear. If there are those in the room who need to surrender their life to you, that they would do that as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve. 
sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.